I'm Alex. And I'm Teddy. And I'm Spencer. And we are the Button Mappers. Hey, the Button Mappers. <laughs> I'm back, bitches. That was un- uncalled for. <laughs> Remember last episode where I was gone? Well, here I am. <laughs> hey, Alex. Let's get, let's get Brian back. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> well, see, we would, but he's, he's gonna, currently he's live gonna streaming. He's you guys... Wrong information. He's going to tell you guys that Rare didn't work on the new Battletoads when indeed they did. Suck it, Brian. <laughs> okay, well, that's what, what he's going to... If he's going to spread lies, then no. Yeah. We can't have misinformation on this show. No. Yeah. <laughs> too, I would too like respectable. to thank Brian, though, for... This is a news outlet. Brian stepped up <laughs> while I was gone. Yeah. yeah. Filled in nicely. He really rattled his role. Speaking of rattling and rolling, today we are rolling in Rare Month with our first discourse, The History of Rare Wear, or Rare, or Wear <laughs> whatever you want to call it. Wear Wear. Wear Wear. We've done this once before. We did the, uh, the Howl one, um, where we kind of broke up three different things and we all covered three different things and we sort of did the same thing this time so uh if you are here to learn we hope you learn if you're here to laugh uh spencer will tell you a joke right now uh okay how do you make a tissue dance by checking out the discord go check out the discord (laughs) and you'll see lots of dancing (laughs) tissues with our friends terry and malta master And if you want to listen to those tissues dance, Alex, where can you do that? Uh, If you want to hear the end of Spencer's joke, uh, check out Spotify and Apple Podcasts. It'll be a Spotify Apple Podcast exclusive. Spencer, how did I do? You did great. Thanks. Knock, knock. Who's there? Go fuck yourself. (laughs) I'm just kidding. (laughs) And don't forget uh, to fuck the subscribe button. (laughs) <laughs> yeah sounds like and a good time t- <laughs> crying to a tissue and throw it at the like button <laughs> <laughs> really dancing on and those uh, yeah. uh leave us a comment where you can tell us to go fuck ourselves or you can good. finish the joke in the comments below yeah what, what was the end of the joke spencer we'll let them we'll let them figure it out i'll now i'll never know yeah, you never know. It's it's a it's a dumb joke though. It's not a good joke. It's it's, oh. it's really bad. Okay. Speaking of really is bad. It, oh, wait, hold on, wait. Is it you put a little boogie in it? Is it is. It? That is the that, that's the other uh, joke. Don't worry about the comment. I, I, I didn't even know the joke. I just <laughs> Damn. for a second. Big brain. <laughs> big brain, Alex. Big brain. Solved it. Solved yeah. the riddle. I did. It. Speaking of big brain, Alex, uh, I'm gonna go first. Uh, we split it up in three ways, and I'm. Um, unless we're going backwards in the rare rare timeline, I'm up. I'm up first. What's up, guys? Um, I researched and research meaning I read the Wikipedia article for like ten minutes. Um, Ultimate play the game, which was rare before rare. Um, the Stanford brothers, uh, what's their name? Like Tim and Chris, right? Yeah. Yes, uh, Tim and Chris. They um, made Ultimate play the game before rare, and I want to talk about that. Um, So originally, they worked in arcade development, which I thought was pretty neat. They even worked on the Konami's game Gyrus, and they made conversion kits. Um, Before uh, they, and like, I think then they were called like the Ashby Computer and Graphics or something, which was their company, because they they lived in like, Ashby was the town. Actually, it's like, it's the the town's name, like Ashby de la Zoch, which, uh, no thank you, I was called Ashby. Um, and then after that, they focused on um, game development for home computers. So then they made Ultimate Play the Game, where they mainly uh, worked on the uh, Spectrum line of computers. Uh, their first release was Jetpack in mm. May of 1983 for the 16K Spectrum. Um, Jetpack is a really iconic game for the company, especially now if you play like the Rare Replay and stuff. 
Um, they always tote Jetpack, but Jetpack's been around and other stuff throughout the years through their, their history. Um, Chris Stamper said that they deliberately targeted 16K machines for as their smaller size meant development time was much shorter, uh, claiming they could produce two 16K games in one month um, or one 48K game. Uh, Jetpack was a huge success. The Spectrum version alone sold more than 300,000 copies, which I'm, I don't know how the home computer market was then, but I know it was big over there. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's their first big success. It was their first game. Uh, they also, other games they, they released for 16K uh, uh, computers, whereas a game called Psst, which I've never heard of. Apparently you're a robot. I don't know. Um, Trans Am, which was a post-apocalyptic game, uh, like uh, a post-apocalyptic game. I oh. played that one either. And Cookie, which I want to play this one. It's a it's it's a cooking themed shoot 'em up. Hmm. Yes, please. Those are not on the Rare Replay. I've never heard of those, um, but those were on the 16K um, computers at the time, and uh, and and some of those games were even bundled in with other ZX Spectrum computers. Their first uh, 48K release was Lunar Jetman, which was a uh, sequel to Jetpack. I played that one, and Attic Attack, which I played that one as well. Um, we also worked on what Gunfright was a game at the time, and Saber Wolf, also another big one for the 48K computers. Um, so you know, a lot of games for the set of Spectrum, um, and a lot of their game styles. Like I think, um, was it uh, Saberman has like the isometric view? It said here that other companies like Ocean would uh, go on to copy that style for some of their other games, like batman apparently i never i don't know batman for the zx spectrum but I'm, I'm just, somebody tell me <laughs> Saberman is more atari looking but there are ones in the which, lineage like which one gun is fright gun, i think is yeah isometric. yeah gun fright is the one i'm thinking of that's like yeah uh, isometric yeah but anyway yeah yeah that style was um was copied <laughs> um with the constant success of ultimate's releases there were rumors of a buyout by ocean um, they did actually sell it, but not to Ocean. They sold it to U.S. Gold. Um, so and then U.S. Gold made a couple games with the Ultimate license, but they weren't actually involved with the uh, production. Um, and then later on, the Saber Brothers bought the rights back, obviously, because you know Rare owns all that stuff now. Um, and then there's some stuff about uh, when they were, you know they changed over to Rare, but I'm not going to talk about that. I'll let Spencer talk about the Rare stuff. Um, but I do want to mention that they have revived some of their ultimate properties in later years. Um, they had a Saber Wolf game for Game Boy Advance, which I've never played. I knew it existed though. Um, and then also Jetpack had a you know the Jetpack refueled game for Xbox. Um, also Jetpack was in DK sixty four. That was neat. Mm. I don't think people talk about that as much. Um, the ultimate era for the company was sort of where like like they plant the seeds for some of what rare also did um, one of them was that they were very secretive with their game development uh which rare also did they the saber brothers did not like talking to the press mm. and um they worked like crazy I, there's a quote here um uh, we were so busy producing a few products a year and making sure they were right i think while we were full-time at ultimate we only had two christmas mornings off uh, and that's how hard it was. We worked seven days a week, 8 a.m. till 1 or 2 in the morning. Um, I don't feel it's any good having engineers who only work 9 to 5 because you get a 9 to 5 game. And that was from Tim Stamper wow. in uh, Crash Magazine of April 1988. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, they kind of like a they, they like uh, the rare is always known for having like a press uh, blackout, especially during like the 90s, you know, SF as well. Um, and. Something I thought was really cool is uh, it says here under the fan section on, on the Wikipedia is that uh, Ultimate were one of the first developers to have their own fan base focused, uh, sorry, uh, you know, uh, fan base focused on the company as a brand as much as the games themselves. Uh, they received so much fan mail at their peak that they hired a full time employee to be to um, deal with up to 60 letters a day. Uh, they were known for their positive attitude for, to fans, always replying to letters and responding to requests for merchandise by sending posters, sweatshirts, and caps for free. Uh, the Sampers later stated they were more interested in, in creating the games than making money for merchandise. Um, so that's a really cool piece of rare history. Ultimate history. 
Um, so yeah, that's about it. You know, the rest of us just talk about how they switched over to Rare and they, you know, eventually bought back the rights to all of the Ultimate stuff. Mm. That's so weird that that a game called Psst is not about cats. <laughs> I know it's a. Uh, hold on, where is it again? <laughs> it's about <laughs> robot. I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you what. The, and then a game the... called Tran- Trans Am is post-apocalyptic. <laughs> okay, so um, the hell am I looking at? I'm trying to figure out where the. Okay. Uh, the game is presented from a single 2D perspective and revolves around Robbie the Robot's objective to defend his plant from interstellar space slugs, leeches, and whatever. Yeah, the, the plant grows in the bottom of the screen. It's a plant game. What the hell am I... <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh! Oh, he has a spray can, so it's psst, like the like you're spraying him. Oh, like okay. a bug. It's like DK3. Mm. Spraying him in the ass. Um, yeah, Trans Am was a post-apocalyptic car game um cookie sounds awesome (laughs) yeah cookie sounds pretty good um so ultimate gaming warrior was that the name ultimate play the game ultimate play the game okay i was confusing wrestling when did they become rare what were the years uh hold on they oh shit wrong article they went defunct in 1987 um and let me see if that's when is that when they went to rare exactly yeah, shortly before the buyout, um, they started Rare Limited. Okay. Uh, what was the beginning year? It says shortly. The buyout was in... Um, no, when were they founded? Oh, sorry. Uh, 1982. So, I, so, so 1982 through 1987. Okay, so a five-year span there. I definitely read a bit about the work culture, even in the modern day. So like that was kind of iconic, I guess, for them and their projects. I think it speaks to a passion in some of those early games and like uh, the creativity. I really like the the kind of like focus on the fans and that kind of culture. Um, how do you think that ultimate gamer ultimate play the game ultimate play the game uh legacy compares to the rare as you know it and love it that's the issue is that i think over here you know it's what well, now not as much but at the time you know and back in the day the focus on like games at home computers weren't as big as it was over there true you know things like the zx spectrum and the amiga and stuff like that aren't you know weren't as, as huge here um so i think a lot of the early rare titles are easy for us as americans to look at and think like oh that's kind of cool and weird like you know some of those games are fun but like they aren't really like nostalgic for us you know they're not like what we would consider you know the classic rare games like battle toads and stuff uh, but i think uh, maybe for like the british audience it's seen as like a classic I think they're, gaming. they're almost synonymous with like the emergence of video games, maybe just off a couple of years, but I guess we're thinking like Atari, maybe like the Pac-Man, maybe like go to the arcades. Like that's kind of the, yeah. the U S game culture at that time. And then this is almost like the emergence within the British scene. And, you know, I guess maybe it's like a hometown hero kind of syndrome where it's like, Oh, we got jetpack. Oh, the saber wolf quadrilogy is coming out, you know? <laughs> yeah. pretty interesting is saber wolf why do i know that name saber wolf because it's a character in uh killer instinct that's not why i know the name it's saber wolf. <laughs> no no it's why it's why <laughs> oh okay listen i don't know what wwe crossover you got going on but yeah <laughs> saber wolf saber wolf i mean that's the, dude you sound so close to how the announcer sounds in killer instinct it's because I'm a diehard Killer Instinct fan, clearly. <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> You've been hiding this from yeah, us. I don't know how you would know that name. I mean, that's a classic. That's just a classic rare game. I mean, I don't, I've known that name. I also have known they even that had name. A ga- they, they had a game on... I think they had a game on like the GameCube or the original Xbox they were producing for a while. I think it was the Xbox that was called like Saber Man or something that they were working on for a long time. They got scrapped. Hmm. Maybe that's the name again, Saber Man. I don't know. 
Well, the guy apparently I'm reading a little bit about it. It's you're the player plays as Saber Man. Yeah. Yeah. But the game is called Saber Wolf. Yeah. It's the same guy that pops up in Banjo Tooie. Nice area. Spoiled it. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> Sorry. No, I can't play the fucking game. <laughs> yeah, it's just never gonna be the theory. same. <laughs> yeah. It's a new saber man pops up at one point. Be like, Look at this fucking guy, I already know who he is. That asshole. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not talking to him. Go back to Ultimate Gamer <laughs> Weekly, bro. <laughs> yeah. Go back to EGM. One more time. Ultimate players. Ultimate okay. play the game. Okay, I'm almost there. Ultimate play the game. <laughs> You know, it's one of those things you have to Ultimate. say it after the other person says it, and then like you internalize it. <laughs> Ultimate play the game. So, uh, so if sorry, what minor spoiler? I, I'm not transitioning yet, but but that I don't necessarily go into all the rare history, um, but I'm reading about it here, and it looks like in 1985 they, they did rare just like offshoot. Like, was it just created as an offshoot of the company? Like. How did yeah, that... that was that was right. Okay, so the ultimate play the game uh, name existed after they sold it. So they, I, I, I'm, I'm guessing they they would have sold it in 1985 then, because they created Rare after that, and then U.S. Gold produced two more games under Ultimate, and then they stopped, and then Rare bought the Ultimate stuff back. I think in '88. Okay. So that's kind of, so. The, so there's like two years there where the Stanford Brothers wouldn't have been involved in Ultimate. But the Stamper Brothers oh. stick around for a while. The Stamper, yeah. they really left their stamp. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's their stamping ground. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if you are interested in playing some of these old games, I know it's kind of you know it's not easy to like hook up your ZX Spectrum. Uh, but they are on the Rare Replay. Some of the games are. I'll tell you which ones I know are off the top of my head. Jetpack, I know is Lunar Jet uh, Lunar Jetman, uh, Attic Attack, Saber Wolf, uh, Underworld, uh, Night Lore, Gun Fright, Ow. No. Yeah, just Gun Fright. Yeah, those are the ones that I know are for sure on the Rare Replay. So if you're listening and you want to experience some of the earlier games in their library... You can on your Xbox. Hey, I just I just unhooked up my ZX Spectrum so I could play my PS5. Should I plug it back in? Yeah. What are you gonna play on your? Are you play Cookie? Yeah, I'm gonna play Cookie. You better play Cookie and <laughs> and Saber Wolf featuring Saber Man. I want it for the cookie. full analysis of that cookie. <laughs> <laughs> How does it work? Do you just shoot chocolate chips? Yeah. What the hell is that? <laughs> I don't know. Hold on. Let's see if I can find a screenshot. Oh, if you're like a little chef. He looks awesome. Okay, and describe it again. What you it's a the game is presented as a 2D perspective. Great. Okay. Uh and the main objective involves Charlie the chef baking a cake from evil sentient ingredients. Charlie. So it's called Cookie. And you bake a cake because you're cooking, but you're also ba- if it's, it's baking though you're not cooking. I don't know. Oh, it's called cooking. No, no, it's called cookie, but it's based on cooking. I'm guessing that's why it's called cookie. <laughs> but <laughs> is this a British thing? Is that like I don't know? Like Were they high? Somebody who's in the who's in the kitchen. They're a cookie. They're really passionate about cooking. You know. <laughs> hey, uh, retro gamer gave it a seventy percent. So yeah. Okay. Hats off. Well, if Retro Gamer did that, then. Pants off? Pan- yeah. I kind of want to see what this... You know, I kind of want to pick up the Saber Wolf game on Game Boy Advance. I hope it's not, like, stupidly expensive now. Hey, you got, like, an 8 out of 10 on across the board, mainly. Okay. Main- I say mainly. Game Informer gave it a 6.5. They didn't pay him off for that one. Unimpressed. Yeah. High standards. <laughs> Saber Wolf on Game Boy Advance. Too many times. Try a little harder. <laughs> <laughs> anyway i'll pass the torch to i think spencer's next okay so, spencer here's the torch oh thank you that was that's pretty smooth yeah all right well he talked about before nintendo i'm going to talk about during nintendo and i found an article on raregamer.co.uk 
and it's about a behind the scenes look at Donkey Kong Country, Ooh. which is really the heart and soul of what they were in the Super Nintendo. And um, which game is that? It was a it was a platformer on the Super Nintendo. You probably missed it, but it's like I've a, never heard of it. A reinvention of Donkey Kong. Remember I was him? playing was... Buster Bust Loose. Oh my God, so was I. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, that's another story. That's a different map out that we're going to get to later. <laughs> Fun, but never trivia. We almost did that. Anyway. Um, but anyway, uh, th- it does get into a little bit of the history. And one of the things I found interesting was, uh, I'll read a little bit from an, an excerpt from it. Following a string of commercial successes during the late 80s and early 90s, they faced an uncertain future, as did the industry in general. The next generation of systems had started to arrive in the form of the 3DO, Amiga CD32, and Philips CDI. But owners of existing 16-bit consoles seemed curiously reticent to upgrade, thanks largely to the unproven nature of CD-ROM systems and the high cost of new hardware. Sensing that the current generation still had some life in it, but simultaneously mindful of an exciting new era just around the corner, the Stampers began to invest heavily in new graphics tech, with the ultimate aim of creating one of the most advanced code houses in the British Isles. And this leads to Silicon Graphics, Mm. which allowed them to create 3D rendered characters. And uh, Nintendo was so into what they saw that they said, you can have one of our biggest franchises that we haven't touched in forever, as Nintendo does. <laughs> and they, they did uh, Donkey Kong, and they let them reinvent Donkey Kong as another platformer. <laughs> because that's the only thing that Super Nintendo had. But they made another platformer, and it's the Donkey Kong that everyone knows and loves, Donkey Kong Country. Uh so that's an exciting thing. There's, there's a, the article hints at something, and they don't outright say it because I don't think it's true, but I, I think it's an interesting discussion. Is Donkey Kong in the in, in the Silicon Graphics 3D engine was made because they were gearing up to compete, I guess, with the 3DO and all those bigger, more expensive consoles that all of them, you know, whatever, ultimately flop. But it's it's hinted that. Donkey Kong or, or Rare in some part was responsible for the failure of those consoles because they were able to make something that is comparable <laughs> but on a ri- on 16-bit hardware that already exists. So kind of an interesting idea to think that way. Again, they don't outright say it, but it's certainly hinted at. Uh, this interview was done with Brendan Gunn, who worked on the graphics. And it says that a uh, funny story is they went to the zoo uh, to, to look at the gorillas and see if they could get something that looked nice um and ultimately they did not apparently it all looked terrible when they tried to actually do it in the in the actual game they said it just looked so horrible and they were they gave up and so <laughs> they said he looked more like a horse and thus we have the donkey kong anime <laughs> yeah <laughs> obviously it's a natural transition uh one interesting thing about the level design is that they use post-it notes to mix and match different pieces. So if they spread it, they had like a whole, a whole level and they put different pieces of it on different post-it notes that they just drew by hand. And what they would do is if they didn't like it in one certain area, they would take the post-it note and either sw- switch it up and mix and match or even take it to a different level entirely. So their whole, all their levels were just a different collaboration of different post-it notes. Which Apparently staples, that's something... staples had to do with the production of dk yeah well you know staples is a great company they do a lot of really good stuff and they got a really good deal right now on post-it notes so if you're a game designer or just a fan of creation in general i highly recommend you use staples and use our promo code button bop (laughs) you'll get 10 percent off your order thank you teddy that's our sponsor staples (laughs) that's my visual promo uh this was (laughs) <laughs> this was yeah, in go, there just go up to the staples counter and tell them but button bob <laughs> button bob give me this <laughs> give me this chair Bring your stapler <laughs> button bob you know what it is no more needs to be said <laughs> they'll go yes sir 
<laughs> You've applied seventy percent off post-it notes. They, 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 yeah, they they bring out a whole pallet worth of post-it notes. <laughs> That's what they used to make uh, Elden Ring. It's just a thousand post-it. Oh my notes. god! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm a game developer. I got my post-it notes. <laughs> It looked like uh, like Charlie and uh, Always Sunny in the mailroom. <laughs> Just everywhere. That's how Legend <laughs> Jumper was conceived. Post-it notes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. In five post-it notes, you get Legend Jumper. Yes, yeah, just, they're all pointing up. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. We got a hidden gem here today, boys. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently... Again, this is what the article says. It's it's a lot of rumor and hearsay, but it is fun to think about. Miyamoto was unimpressed with Donkey Kong Country. He said the focus was too much on graphics and not enough on gameplay. And I found that to be interesting, not because I think he's a bad guy or he's he's wrong or anything. This is all allegedly if there's they've asked him since and he's denied this. Yeah, he took it back later. Yeah. <laughs> he's taking it back. I don't know if he's... He, he says that he never had any issues with it, but it, apparently that's what he said in the past. Um, uh, but I do find it interesting because he was saying that before, like, our internet community... Like, I hear that all the time on shows now, like, on the YouTube channels now, as people arguing that they don't care about the graphics as much as gameplay, et cetera, et cetera. And I just find it interesting that Miyamoto, the most legendary game designer was also saying that about Donkey Kong Country. It's just like, I don't know. I think Donkey Kong Country is arguably better than Super Mario World. Oh, not absolutely. Just in, not just in graphics, but in level design and gameplay. <laughs> if you, if you um, and I, well, and like, I, you know, I always believe that quote because there's the evidence that like, if you look at Yoshi's Island, apparently they wanted him to do it pre-rendered and you can see remnants of that with like the first cutscene, And then he made it like a coloring book. Yeah. And it's I like think the that's opposite. Him being like, nope. <laughs> <laughs> this is a big fuck you to everybody. <laughs> He's like an angry child. <laughs> Yo, Yoshi's Island crayon. <laughs> you want to look realistic, like with this crayon? <laughs> <laughs> um, apparently, so apparently, Gun's only regret uh, with the game was the map screens. He said that he did all these great pre-rendered maps, uh, but the the characters only went in like a straight line from level to level. And he had he had plans that, and I think they do this in maybe in one of the other Donkey Kongs, or I can't remember. But he wanted to do it in the first one, where you, when you go to the next stage, it, the the characters will walk on the map in like the right, like in a in a path that looks yeah. kind of natural. The third game kind of has like an open map. Yeah, I'm confused. And I think that's Don't what he the wanted. GBA ones or something. Do I feel like later editions you see Donkey on the map? Am I just not I understanding meant, like, what you're saying? Like you could traverse the island. In yeah. Way? Well, in 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 the in the Donkey Kong ones, you, you just shoot the the Don the, the the guy. He just goes from one end to the other, like in a straight line. Like his character just moves. Yeah. But he wanted it to where the the the, the Donkey Kong would actually like walk. And it would be not on like a straight line. It would be like if you're going up a mountain, he would like climb the mountain to the next level. He just he thought that in the, in the first one, it was just very lazy. Okay. Oh. No. So it's pretty more like like three because three had like the sections or like the boat where you're like sailing around the areas and stuff. And you could get off the boat and like walk around the maps. Yeah, he talks a little bit about the second and third, although he says they just weren't as important to him. Uh, he didn't. He wasn't as big of a fan of them, especially I'm assuming three. And he said that the two, the two effects that he really liked were the flooded ship and the honey effects. And he said he couldn't remember which games those are from. Pretty sure those are both two. Yeah, yeah, they're both two. Definitely honey, but yeah. So I'm pretty sure he didn't really care for the third one, which seems to go along with what most people think of the series. So map out on that coming soon. Did did, <laughs> he, did they mention the like the making the character models or anything? No, that that all was tied up in the the 3D uh, silicon graphics. They didn't talk too much about it. Just that it w it was amazing to Nintendo, and they loved it. Well, I I remember hearing about them about the uh, the the development of those games, and where it was so early on, 
in order to make the character like the um the frames of animation it, they, they would spend one day making one frame it took that long to render it that's crazy <laughs> yeah <laughs> which i mean i guess makes sense at the time <laughs> And and such a far cry from their from their past where they were doing like two two games a month. Yeah, it's like today we got one one <laughs> frame of animation of DK like crouching. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it's really impressive that Rare is like they made one of the most iconic Super Nintendo games. I think when you think about the boundary pushing software on the console, it's country and star fox star fox not as much for like the best reasons i mean like they use like the f the mode 7 or something but i mean mm-hmm. it was really like an advent for like 3d polygons and everything and they had a couple mm-hmm. guys who were like really hard workers passionate about work they got some americans working on it it was it was uh, argonaut right mm-hmm. yeah and then i feel like with country it's kind of the same story so it's just i don't know it's just interesting to see the talents that made that pushed the technical spectrum on the console. Yeah. I I would really love to investigate some of the Banjo Kazooie era stuff. He this guy worked on Donkey Kong 64 and has like zero things to say about. <laughs> 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 but I'm I'd be very interested to learn more about the making of uh, Banjo Kazooie cuz that'd be like their biggest offshoot during the Nintendo era. Most successful one, I would say. Kind of sad you didn't talk about uh, Jordan versus Bird on the Nintendo. Next time. Jordan versus Bird one on one. Is that a basketball game? Yeah. Yeah. What happened to Mr. Okay. Pants? Yeah, hey, it's Mr. Pants on Game Boy Advance. Did you write that? That's too clever. That should be the slogan. No, I didn't write What? <laughs> Hey, it's Mr. Pants on Game Boy Advance. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Well, do a dance. All right, are we segueing? Segway. Yeah. Yeah. I'm riding. Hold on. Let me get my segue. Do you want me to pass the torch to you? Yes. I don't want to be left hanging. I don't want the torch to go out, you know? Other side? Well, I'm glad you wanted to hear about Banjo Kazooie, Spencer. I can't talk to you about that. But I can tell you about how oh. Rare was bought out by Microsoft in 2002 and everything everyone loved about Banjo-Kazooie went to shit. <laughs> Many people consider the worst era in Rare history when Microsoft acquired them. The buyout happened in 2002. Microsoft was kind of fresh off launching the Xbox, their first console. And there was sort of a clamor over who would get Rare. Who would be acquiring Rare? Because Nintendo didn't... They had 50% of the shares at the time of the N64. But they did not commit to put down the other 50%. And Microsoft seized that opportunity to swipe them under the rug and claim them and do great things, promising, wonderful experiences. And it just never really came to fruition. I read an article by Eurogamer. Simon Parkin was the contributor. And this was written in 2012. Who killed Rare? So... An inflammatory Ooh. title, but I think at that time uh, there was some underwhelming aspect to 10 years of Rare. Did Microsoft ruin Britain's greatest game studio? I have some quotes. On the 20th of September 2002, Microsoft paid $375 million for this bonsai tree and all that it symbolized. Creative excellence, technical mastery, innovation, originality, soul, and the precious fingerprints of Nintendo, the fledgling Microsoft Game Studios, desperate to acquire world-class talent that could help establish its game console, saw in that tree everything it desired to become. Ten years later, and Bill Gates is yet to plant a bonsai tree in Rare's once fertile grounds. So I think that when, at that time, you're looking back at the legacy of what Microsoft had done with Rare, you see that maybe they failed to deliver some promises or um, I guess kind of come off of the N64 era that they were so known and beloved for, even off of country, you could say. Um, This is attributed to several things, especially a workplace culture. Uh, So I got another quote here. 
there was a gradual introduction of certain Microsoft behaviors that crept into the way we did things. Lots more meetings, performance reviews, and far more regard for your position within the company. The two main uh, rare employees that were interviewed here, I think um, one of their names was like Phil Tallis. I think he was working on Diddy Kong Country and Dinosaur Planet, which became Star Fox Adventures. And then there's another guy, Hollis, who was uh, employed at the um, Killer Instinct time. The way that they described the culture prior to working under Microsoft was that they were working for Tim and Chris Stamper. Mainly, Tim and Chris left us to our own devices. They recognized the talent and left teams to make their game, intervening only when a team was broken or underperforming in their judgment. Nevertheless, they do describe how even working under Tim and Chris was exhausting, but that everybody was more motivated because they felt like they were creating their own products. With Microsoft, there was a lot of like, for the first time, we're making, you know, the big games. We're kind of figuring this out together. Um, and I think that they felt while working with Nintendo that Nintendo had a bit more, I guess, uh, expertise in the field. They had done it many times. And also, I guess if you look at the history going from uh, Ultimate Play. The game. The game. Got it. Uh you had seen that kind of like independence and also expertise. And then since they joined Microsoft, Microsoft had their own ambitions, things that they were hoping to accomplish. Rare was considered kind of a bad match because Rare always kind of leaned into that more uh, charismatic, cartoonish style that Nintendo was kind of known and loved for, the kind of like kid crowd. And so you had kind of a mismatch. You know, they said that the bride is beautiful and the groom is beautiful, but together they both want to go in different directions. The problem here was that Rare was a very long way from the very corporate structure of Microsoft. And when Rare had made games, it wasn't in isolation from Nintendo, but as a creative partnership. So at that time, 2012, it's been 10 years now since then. So, I mean, we can look back and see that Rare kind of still hasn't done a lot. But it's very interesting to see that, like, that sentiment was so strong at the time, killed Rare, the death of Rare, that they accomplished nothing since that time. I think they did their own thing and that you can still see games with, you know, hints of talent. And they kind of allude to that at the end of the article. But the general consensus is that the Microsoft era Rare is not the Rare of old and a bit of a sad sight to see. That's my it would review. Be, it would be interesting to look at the the history of some of the bigger names to see when they may have left uh, the company. Like the I, I believe the Stampers left during Perfect Dark Zero, if I'm not wrong. Oh shit! That's that quickly. I no, I might be wrong about that. It was either that or Via Pinata. I think Via Pinata might might actually be it. Well, t- it says in in my article it says Tim found a smart form, smartphone game studio with his son called Fortune Fish. So I can yeah. look up on that. Was I have that, actually. They did an interview and with uh, with Tim Stamper. Not them. Not the Eurogamer people. I had another one from Nintendo Life. They just didn't have a lot. Rare co-founder has no idea why Nintendo didn't buy the studio outright. Apparently, I think Activision was the other company that was vying for mm. acquiring Rare. <laughs> oh, God. It didn't happen. Uh, Microsoft did instead. Um, Microsoft was really like pushing for like just acquiring the top talents. You got to remember, this is like one year after the Xbox. So they're just trying to acquire as many IPs as possible. And a lot of people view that era as like, oh, they acquired them and then just did nothing with them. And so uh, there, but there's also that interest of like Nintendo didn't really see much of a future in them. Stamper is at a loss as to why Nintendo didn't step in and open up his checkbook. I have no idea why they didn't do that. I thought we were a good fit. But he does say that the price of software development was going up with platforms and uh, Rare works really well with a partner. We were looking for someone. And then he says he liked Microsoft at the time. Well, the thing is that Nintendo is known for making stupid decisions anyway. But um, I believe Nintendo actually, I, I don't think they had exactly 50. I, I, I think they had closer to like 49% share. So yeah, I really Nintendo that's had how 49 like, yeah, because that's how Microsoft stepped in and bought the other 51 and scooped it all up. 
Um, so good, but yeah, they were. Uh, <laughs> they, I mean, they they've been second party since what, like the NES? Because I remember like the NES, um, one of their earlier games. Uh, I don't. I wish I could tell you which one it was. Um, they showed them uh, a demo of the game, and Nintendo was like blown away by what they were able to do on the NES. Um, and yeah, they they've been they work close together since then. So it is s- really surprising that like Nintendo didn't jump at the chance. But again, it's Nintendo, and they make some dumb choices sometimes. I bet they were like, yeah, we can just we could do better than that yeah they kind of were i do want to correct you though so it does say in 1993 it was 49 percent share that uh nintendo had purchased but in um it was a couple years later when people from rare reached out to explain what their situation was they were 50 percent owned by nintendo and nintendo had an option to acquire the other half if by a certain date if they didn't exercise that option rare had the option to find a buyer for nintendo's half so oh, that's what that was, sta- okay. the stampers that were looking for potential buyers and then microsoft stepped up to the plate i think like well that would yeah, go yeah go ahead. well i was gonna say that would explain why they didn't they didn't buy it because maybe they didn't seem deem it like worth all the money that it would take to acquire the rest of it they said they felt that the make... decision was necessary, too. If you look at the N64, they're actually explaining in one of the articles. I don't know if it was the Stampers or the Hollis or the whatever. Um, but they're saying, like, the N64 was viewed as kind of a like a commercial failure, and the GameCube was, like, even worse. So, like, it was, like, the Xbox is, like, new hot stuff. Chris and I mm-hmm. needed to take a new direction to produce some better, greater products for the future. And we thought the only way we'd be able to do that was to take a step sideways and pursue a new venture. They left in 2007, by the way. So I was, yeah, so it was right. It must have been yeah. right after uh, Via Pinata then. Mm-hmm. Well, that that makes a lot of sense too. Nintendo, this is kind of a dick bag move, but <laughs> it also worked out, I think, for them is that their biggest success, aside from Banjo Kazooie, I, I don't necessarily know the numbers, but their business, their biggest success was with the Nintendo franchise, and so it's like, well, we don't need rare to make that because we already have we still have it so i guess we're losing banjo kazooie <laughs> so, so, well and it, it sounds jerk. to me you know it's easy it's easy to like to be like well rare has sucked since the buyout but i i honestly with the way you're describing the work environment i mean it's i think it's mostly to blame for for microsoft it's it's it sounds like they 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 opened the the doors and you know and you know and they were obviously obviously having a new console you're gonna want names to draw people in and have you know games and stuff makes sense the xbox is basically you know the the, the more powerful gamecube and ps2 i mean a freedom for its time stuff so you're gonna draw this big studio in buy them out and then instead of letting them make their games it sounded like they were like okay well we're doing it this way and just kind of stepped on everything rare was used to doing, <laughs> um, which it makes no sense. Like, why would you, you have a brand new console. You don't know what you're doing and you're going <laughs> to come in and tell the studio that's been making gold for the last 10 years to <laughs> do things your way. <laughs> I, I think I can see what Microsoft was trying to do with rare was to appeal, like get the young gamers mm-hmm. to get into Microsoft for a couple of reasons. You can get the the parents to buy in, to be like, oh, there are kitty games for it, so do that, and then also to get that like early install base, so that you know kids could say they grew up with Microsoft, and then you get the 360, and you, know, you have an installed base there. But yeah, it seems like they didn't really handle Rare very well, so that all those games were trash, <laughs> and it was like, oh. <laughs> not good well, so the two know. games they made for xbox weren't awful it's just the fact that like they they could have done way better and they could have done more yeah you know the same thing happened with um kind of off subject with with you know with the, uh, the original xbox same thing happened with uh odd world and uh lauren landing and odd world inhabitants um you know they were on ps1 and then they brought them over to xbox and microsoft helped with i think much as odyssey and nothing nobody cared they had the it was just the wrong audience for that for that that series yeah i think there's a lot of missteps in looking at just what was the microsoft work culture with rare um 
so I have some quotes here. I just want to pick some good ones. Um, one of the biggest changes was the freedom to talk about projects that you weren't working on. So you had mentioned the black light. I don't know if that's the phrase you use, but where they're not allowed to talk about uh, it. Uh, blackout. Blackout. Yeah, okay. yeah the, like media blackout. Yeah. So this seems like a good thing. We were allowed to use the internet during working hours. We were allowed to listen to music. So a lot of the early changes were positive to morale. However, in time, it became clear that everyone had underestimated how much of the studio's success was down to Nintendo's gentle steering. It's almost like Microsoft is just like, okay, go. And they didn't even know what they're doing because they, you know, they're still trying to figure out what are the big hits. They wanted hit games for their console. Since they weren't sure how to go about it, they trusted Rare to do what was necessary. The problem here was that Rare was a very long way from the very corporate structure of Microsoft. And when Rare had made games, it wasn't in isolation from Nintendo, but as a creative partnership. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it's just kind of like Microsoft is like, yeah, we got them. We got the best guys in the business. They'll know what to do. All right, go. <laughs> 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 cameo that's that's <laughs> I, that sounds very true and also i think also like once the stampers leave in 2007 i think that's like that's just the uh, they're got, they're done after that because that they they drove so much of that company i remember reading about um the development of goldeneye and how nintendo pulled backing for that for a while because they didn't have faith in it mm. and the stampers never told the team the the team like the like like the stampers were paying the team but they were getting no funding from uh, from Nintendo f uh, during that time for for the, the the development of Goldeneye and the stampers were like we have faith in this product so we're just going to let them make it and we're just going to pretend like everything's okay <laughs> 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 and, and 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 honestly like i think once the stampers leave it's just like a, it's, it's a sign of like things to come for the studio Yeah, Three I think it's demoralizing, from... right? Because those guys were there since what the like er, the founding, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They they founded the company, and I think maybe I don't know. <laughs> I, it's just like without their leadership, maybe the that that, that could be also why Rare just kind of fell apart. I still don't think some of those Xbox and 360 games were awful. Don't you know? I think they had some cool stuff, but mm -hmm. yeah, I, don't, I think it wasn't Cameo like decent. Yeah. We'll Cameo was rushed. Tomorrow. <laughs> it wasn't bad, but it was rushed. Um, and then Perfect Dark Zero is... I didn't rushed. play it, so I'm not going to say much. <laughs> Though, those two were those two were very rushed for a 360 release in 2005. Like, you know, for the console release. Yeah. Um, I think you have another issue here. This is interesting to me. The other staffing change was the introduction of a producer role. Da -da -da -da. Pro producers were a new thing to rare. It wasn't a role that was instantly understood. And each project had a rare producer and a Microsoft producer, one either side of the Atlantic. So, you know, it's interesting to me that like they're having, you know, like, because I think the thing that stands out to me is like, oh, there's like a corporate culture. There's meetings every week they're talking about. And I, when I think of Rare, I don't think of that. I think of them drinking beers and like cracking jokes and then writing <laughs> into the script for like Banjo. And then it's like, you want to re like remove all of that and just like do a solid tried and true approach. And then you've got two conflicting roles. That's not like having two bosses that are like have different, uh, you know, needs. And then suddenly that stress is going down to your employees. It just sounds like a bad workplace. Um, yeah. I think they managed okay, all things considered, but... You know, I think you see some missteps due to that. I think, and like the whole thing with with Nintendo is, I don't think Nintendo ever got got too involved. They just kind of were like, "You should maybe do this way" or something, you know. But I, but I don't think they ever had like a Nintendo producer on hand. Like, like I think like in the like Star Fox Adventure, which is arguably one of their worst games, was the only one that like like Miyamoto was like, "Yeah, change it," and then they, it was worse uh, than what they probably could could have made. Um, but. Nintendo, you know, no, 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 I'm not going to let you sit. Nintendo has never stepped into a Star Fox game and actively made it worse. Dude, How dare you I do not want to talk about Star Fox right now. <laughs> <laughs> I do not want to open the Star Fox paradox where <laughs> if Nintendo tries something different, it's fucking hated. And if Nintendo does the same thing again, it's fucking hated. So I don't want to talk about Star Fox right now. Um, but anyway, but like, even, even at that time, it seemed like rare still had a little bit of that, like freedom you were talking about, Teddy, where like they, cause like, I remember like the, uh, the development of the conquerors 12 tales before it was, um, bad fur day, uh, 12 tales. They thought you know, after a while that the, 
the team thought it felt too close to Banjo and Mario 64 and stuff. And then w- one of the guys, he wasn't even like lead on the team or anything. He just was like, hey, why don't we just change it to this this more crude game? And then the Stanford brothers were like, okay, well, you, you're you in charge then. You you make it. <laughs> so, you know, so it's just like the guy just had an idea. They're like, okay, well, you do it then. And then yeah bad fur day happened and it's i don't know if that if that kind of freedom would would be under like that sort of environment where like you have a microsoft producer and a rare producer they did make nuts and bolts yeah and that's actually kind of the glimmer (laughs) and hope uh at the end of this article here which is very interesting here um it's difficult to square this positivity with the reality of his current output da 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 um, my seven-year-old son woke me up a couple mornings ago because he couldn't find Banjo Kazooie Nuts and Bolts. As you might imagine, he has lots of games to choose from, but that's the one he wanted to play. That game of all games. It says to me there's still some magic left at rare. So we liked I like to shit on nuts and bolts. Honestly, though, I mean I've put more time into it. It's an homage. I can respect it as that. And so, I mean, it is nice to acknowledge that like Okay, we didn't just like, you know, because if you just play the first five minutes of that game, it's like, this is insulting. This is terrible. This is not the banjo I know and love. What the hell is, why are there carts? You know, um, banjo pilot. But uh, I think um, seeing it here, even acknowledged by like the creator's son that he's having fun with the game. Alex talks about how he's put a lot of time into the game. You know, you can really invest yourself into it. That there is still some fun. It's not just like, the game's not just like a Fable 3. Fable 3 is disgusting. You know, and I played that game start to finish. So, I don't know. Yeah, Fable 3 is disgusting. Um, it, well, and Nuts and Bolts is sad as well because that was like the game. You can obviously tell if you play it that the team put a lot of like love and care into what they made. Like they had faith in that project mm-hmm. and it did not sell nearly as well as they were hoping mm-hmm. and that was like the last straw with microsoft after that they were like okay well you're making connect games for a bit and then they just got them on that and they did like connect sports and shit and it was <laughs> kind of like a sad time they didn't they didn't create another original idea or game until sea of thieves you know like that was yeah it was sad <laughs> so uh like like nuts and bolts is like for me it's like the only game out of that well, maybe via Pinata, but those are like the only games out of that later library that like just feel like maybe look more of an authentic rare experience. But at the same time, I don't think it's right for the Xbox crowd. And I think Microsoft realized that. Yeah. Bad partnership, you know, good company, yeah. good games or good ideas, you know, just wrong platform. Maybe. Can you imagine Banjo-Kazooie and Nuts and Bolts on GameCube? That'd probably be a hit. I don't think it would have been nuts and bolts. It would have been a, a platformer game, probably. Banjo Three was eluded. Yeah, yeah. So, so then they make Banjo Three. Wasn't that uh, ukulele? Is that pilot? Wasn't that pilot? Like Grunty's was that Grunty takes a shower? Yeah. <laughs> they you no. Know, there, there is, there is hope on the horizon, though. Okay, see if these is not awful. It's a fun game. For what it is, um, Spencer, shut up. Ranking next um, week Monday. You know they they worked on the Battletoads reboot. That's neat, um, and there is hope. I I think Everwild is looking cool, and you know we haven't seen too too you know too much of it yet. But I think what I've seen, I, I like, and uh, I want to know um, where it's going to go. And also, we we sort of seen Microsoft do a cool thing where they take these rare IPs and instead of just leaving them with rare, they give them the people that maybe could do some more, you know, do better <laughs> with them now. Like the killer instinct series is, you know, that was a big launch title for the Xbox one. Um, and that's a different developer. Um, rare teamed up with a, with a different developer for battle toads reboot. And then next year, it's still slated for next year. We'll see what happens. But next year we're, we're supposed to get more info and, and a release date for perfect dark, which is not by rare. And if you even want to take the Platonic Games route, Demon Turf is supposedly yeah, pretty true. good. <laughs> Just saying. Spencer, you look distraught. Spencer, what, what, what are you going to say about Killer Instinct? No, no, it's, I, it's just a, what you said about Microsoft's strategy with Rare games is, is a little bad. Taking them away from Rare. 
<laughs> yeah, it's it's what? true though. I mean, I like that story. They've been doing better with it. Here's an idea. What if we bought a company that makes really good games, mm-hmm. gutted them, <laughs> found out they can't I'm make any saying, good games no, 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 somehow, no. I'm and then gave this, those games to other I'm, companies? I'm saying at this point, at this point where we're at now, Rare is making their game, Sea of Thieves, Everwild, and stuff. That's cool. Rare's doing their own thing now. They're yeah. taking the properties that Rare isn't using and giving them to other people. That Rare did use and make very, you know, it's not the bolt. It took yeah. 20 years, but I think we're on to something. We might get a return what? investment. Invest while we're I'm low. I'm just saying, like, I'm just sword. happy, like, they're, at this point, they're, they're, it seems like they're making the best out of a bad situation. That is a very positive way to look at it, and I admire that. Very good, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> I feel this week is a cool game on the Xbox One. <laughs> Ranking Whatever. coming soon. <laughs> um, takeaways. Uh, so, I like whale. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> whale, whale. Whale, whale. I put whale, whale, whale. What did you guys learn? What's the significance of Rareware in the 2022? The history? In 2022? Yeah. Um, there's a pirate game that you can play if you want. And then there's <laughs> another game that's coming out that might not be um, terrible. <laughs> you know, I, think, I think most people know the legacy of Rare, like the games that they've produced throughout the years. But I don't know if a lot of them know, like the uniqueness of the studio themselves like you know that that they they were a very unique studio that did things kind of their own way yeah i think i respect the the work ethic i didn't know that the stampers were there for a long time those aren't even names i was familiar with so you know 23 oh. years then fortune fish whatever you know they, they can have their mobile company that's weird to me but um i respect the you know their hands-off approach and the kind of uh, beauties it did lead to. It's sad it didn't work in the Xbox era. But it sounds like Nintendo was going to let them go anyway. You know, I think I always thought of it as like Microsoft shooting them in the foot. But I think it was kind of a, it's kind of like a best of a shitty situation kind of thing. It's not so weird. It was like Nintendo had like the GameCube and the GBA. And like they clearly... At the time, they were tr- they were trying everything to like dig the GameCube out of a hole. <laughs> they were giving games to like every like they were like oh Pokemon RPG and uh, there's a Wario platformer and uh, F Zero and uh, no we got we got 1080 snowboarding and it's like oh shit and, yeah they could not dig the GameCube out of the the hole that they they, they were in. I mean it's beloved now, but it's sold terrible for the company. Um, and it's so weird to me that like they wouldn't take that opportunity to be like, yeah, we have rare games too. <laughs> like that's that seems like that's kind of what they might have needed. I may, I think maybe they just didn't have the purchasing power. That's what because they, they were at fifty percent shares, and that they didn't put the other fifty yeah. down. I just think that maybe they and maybe they didn't see like a long term return. They didn't have Reggie. They had faith in the. You know, if Reggie was there, the maybe we would have got rare. Two thousand years ago, like we we can't buy rare. We're making the e reader, guys. <laughs> hey, CEO's got to make some tough decisions every once in a while. <laughs> and that, that's, that was it. <laughs> Paid off. <laughs> Here at Nintendo, e-reader. we're about innovating. We like to read yeah. e cards. It's the future. Elect- the, the electronic the Donkey Kong bongos. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. There's hit. somebody there's somewhere there is somebody there's some conversation at Nintendo where they're like, Hey, what happened to Rare? And then and then he's he's got like an e reader card on his desk and he just pushes it behind it real quick. The e reader is happened. Miyamoto's grudge. It's his grudge continued against country. Yeah. Nah, let it burn with Microsoft. <laughs> the e reader is the future. Oh what it failed? Just like that? Yeah. Like it failed like immediately, like yeah, nobody yeah, ever like, gave a shit. Nobody about it. gave a shit about the e-reader. Wait, dude. you're telling me Banjo the three e-reader. on the GameCube could have been a million seller? Shit. <laughs> it seems. Oh my god, yeah. 
strange. <sighs> strange and sad. Luckily, though, the games that were great will always be there. So you can always experience, you know, the years of rare before. Just replay them for the rest of your life in sadness with your <laughs> potato chips and root beer. What? Not in sadness. Lament that I'd play... Microsoft killed all the bullet to their brains. The creative genius of Two... rare. The Went. the my two like most favorite games of all time are both rare games. They're both banjo and country. Like, yeah. I'm not sad. I'm gonna fucking enjoy these games. Yeah. No, I'm joking. I mean, I like I like playing it on Xbox. If anything, also we kind of seen like uh, with the advent of like ukulele that maybe some of those team members weren't ready to make another game like banjo. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't Brian say there's a rare renaissance? <laughs> no, he's. I don't, I don't know what the hell he was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Brian, explain yourself. <laughs> I mean, I am excited to see whatever wild is. Don't get me wrong, but yeah. I don't know what the hell he's talking about. Ever crap. Ever you don't wild. even know what it is. Man. Leave it alone. <laughs> I'll wash best game away you my wear. <laughs> ever wild ever wild brought to you by where. the Foo Fighters <laughs> by Dave Grohl okay so next week Lionhead Studios the history no uh, oh, ranking no. rare <laughs> games <laughs> okay yeah I will rank some rare games next week join us next week uh, we're going to find out why. Hold on, I have to pull up a funny game. Sesame Street ABC is ranked S. The letter S. For Sesame Seed. For Stampers. <laughs> yeah, Stamper. We should just get rare employees. A D, a D for David Weiss. You know, you're doing the stamp thing earlier, and I can't help but think about Capitulated. <laughs> Capitulate. Yeah. Capitulate. Stamper. Tim. Hi. Hey, y'all. Don't forget to subscribe to them button mappers.